The following is a local resident producer's program. The program content is the sole responsibility of the producer and does not necessarily reflect the views or policies of CATV2, Oshkosh Community Media Services, the City of Oshkosh, or Time Warner Cable. Everybody, welcome to Ion Oshkosh. Cheryl Hanson, Dan Rylance here, and very pleased to welcome back to the show uh, Professor Jim Simmons, political science uh, professor from the University of Wisconsin at Oshkosh. He was on a few weeks back, or about a month ago, uh, talking about uh, the um, recall elections that were upcoming and so forth. And uh, now we've got some results, and we're yeah. back to you're back to talk to us about those. Um, it, we're taping this on the 18th of August, and uh, you know we just had a recall election two days ago there was another one a week ago and uh, so we've got two different um, election dates to talk about overall what were your impressions of the way things went well actually they came out exactly the way I thought they would I thought the Democrats would pick up probably two seats I thought they might pick up a third but I didn't know which one it could be and um, I thought this week the Democrats would probably hold the seats that were contested and they did, and they did impressively by a wider, wider margin than I really anticipated. Mm -hmm. Were you at all, um, since this is where the you know the the Hopper district is? Uh, let's talk a little bit about that. Were you at all surprised about anything about the way that election went? Um, did you expect him to lose by a larger margin, or you, you, you've forgotten, Cheryl, that 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 uh, Dan made me bet the farm. <laughs> I know, that, I remember. Uh, I remember, that, but that I'm Hopper, just asking. That Hopper would win, and, and, or Hopper would, would lose, lose. And, and he did, He's still as farming. I expected. Yeah. Um, and it came out exactly the way I thought it would. Yeah. I thought um, um, that King would carry Oshkosh again, and that uh, Hopper would do a little bit worse in Fond du Lac, and that Wapan, which had turned the difference last time, would shift. And it came out exactly that way. So. And remember when Hopper was on, he was going to take all those all, all those communities. Well, yeah, he was going to yeah. take yeah. them all. Yeah, he was in battle yeah. Yeah. mode. <laughs> I mean, he, he worked hard at this campaign and yeah. uh, that a lot of money was spent and uh, it was it was close. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it was not a, a runaway by any means. Mm -hmm. So, you have to credit him with not, you know, given his personal problems, he didn't back off. Um, he didn't follow the advice of uh, uh, the radio talk show person Charlie Sykes and step out for another Republican. Um, uh, I think he did as well as any candidate would have in this race. Another one that was... was Can I ask one more question? Oh, uh, sure, yeah. Um, do you think voters voted primarily to oust Hopper rather than to elect Jessica King? Um, I, I think that, frankly, that this election was a referendum on Governor Walker okay. as much as anyone else. I mean, he, he wasn't named by anyone. Um, and I think many Republican voters were as concerned with President Obama <laughs> as they okay. were the local races. Okay. So, um, no, I, I don't think the Democrats offered uh, extensive platform or right. proposals for what they would have done or what they proposed doing. Um, this was pretty generic. And it was um, a race that didn't even focus on collective bargaining by either side That's on right. this race. Yeah. Um, the, the Republicans weren't taking credit for okay. effectively eliminating collective bargaining, and the Democrats weren't challenging it. Uh, much of it was personal, not just in this race, because in other races, uh, you know, the focus was on Republicans who didn't pay their taxes mm -hmm. or paid them late. Mm -hmm. And um, 
this wasn't the only race where personal problems came up. I mean, right at the end, as I told you it would, there would be some 30 part party group that would focus on Hopper's alleged um, girlfriend mm -hmm. and uh, her appointment. Uh, but throughout the race, Fred Clark was being attacked for the hitting a bicyclist that where he was caught on a webcam and um, threatening to smack around one of his potential constituents. This and is a Democratic he, candidate against Luther Olson. Against Luther Olson, okay. that's right. Yeah. Okay. And uh, the fact that he hadn't paid child support. So um, uh, focusing on the personal in this race was uniform uh, by parties. Do you think that they felt that that was the only way they could win this, is to go for the personal jugular rather than the issues? That's always effective. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, you do the opposition yeah. research, and if you have it, yeah. you use it. Um, people can relate to that. And, but so uh, much so. So much so. Okay, all right. Um, on the other hand, the Democrats were talking about wealthy interests in business and, mm -hmm. you know, associating not paying taxes with um, many of the policies that had been enacted by the Walker administration. Yeah. So. I mean, it had a substantial policy focus, even though it was a, a personal attack. Yeah. Do you think uh, Hopper will, will run again, regardless of how King does in the remainder of this term? I'd be surprised if he did. You'd I mean, be surprised he, if he did? Yeah, I'd okay. be surprised if he did. I mean, it was close. I think um, next time he'll probably take the advice and some other candidate will come forward. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, he really was someone that I think Republicans had high anticipations for. You, you don't get the appointment to the Joint Finance Committee as a rookie freshman mm -hmm. legislator unless your party feels that you have uh, ambitions uh, to higher office. And uh, I think he was a disappointment. Okay. Uh, another race that was very, very close was the Alberta Darling race. Um, any thoughts on that one? Um. Actually, that race wasn't as close as I anticipated. Uh, in 2008, when she ran against Sheldon Wasserman, it was even closer. Mm -hmm. Of course, that was the, the year that Obama was carrying the state with, sure. you know, mm -hmm. by 14 points. And um, um, she had a fairly articulate woman, right demographic, to be running against her. And, um, I, you know, I, I don't think she did quite as well as I anticipated. Um, the turnout in that recall was huge, 58%. <laughs> so obviously, I think Republicans in that area were really energized. I mean, you know. And um, uh, the close race, the one the Democrats might have picked up um, was Luther Olson's race. I mean, it's in this area, and um, he only won by four points. And Luther's rarely had an opponent since his first election out. He was even surprised to be in this situation. And I think that um, if it hadn't been for Fred Clark's personal issues that that Wisconsin Right to Life picked up on and ran those those commercials, that um, that was the race that might have shifted it to the Democrats. Well, let's talk about that for just a second because you know um, they used him hitting uh, a pedestrian, if you mm -hmm. will, and Jessica King also had hit a pedestrian uh, about a year and a half or two years ago. There was a brief mention of that made, I think, in some ads, but that didn't seem to really affect her. Why would well, it affect Well, there are a number of people so who have DUIs, other? too, but they're not caught on a webcam. I mean, remember Peg Lottenschlager? Oh, yes. Or you <laughs> have the case of the mayor of Marinette? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think yeah. that if um, Sheboygan and Marinette's mayors had not been seen and become mm -hmm. uh, instant YouTube classics, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that they might have survived it. It's okay. one thing for that to be reported in the newspaper and forgotten. It's another for it to be, you know, something you're reminded of every time you see a 30-second spot. It's the imagery. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. <clears throat> Two kind of general questions. If you're writing a headline for these recall elections, and there's a spin both ways, would you use a small V for victory for the Democrats, a, or a small L for loss for Republicans, or a push? How, how, what would your headline read? Well, this comes between a push and a small victory for the Democrats. Okay. I mean, um, these districts were Republican-leaning districts, with the, with the exception of Kopanke's. Okay. I mean, if the Democrats had chosen to fight on good ground, they would not have chosen 
these eight. Okay. Uh, outside of Kempanke, uh there really weren't any uh, Republicans who were vulnerable. Okay. I mean, in terms of the traditional voting behavior. Um, uh, these Senate races, on average, uh, Governor Walker got 56% of the vote. And um, the outcome of this race, the Democratic candidates averaged 51% of the vote. So you, you see a big shift. Okay, a follow-up. With a small V victory then for Democrats in the recall election, does this lessen or increase the chances that they will try to recall Governor Walker? Well, you know, I don't really think the Democrats initiated the recall effort. Okay. I think they were pretty much forced into it. They were forced into it first because generally recalls are a Republican tool. I mean, you have to remember that uh, Bob LaFollette and the progressives, uh, Bob was a uh, Republican governor, right. and the kinds of tools which have been used to recall people have tended to be by Republicans who are dissatisfied with uh, Holprin because of his position on Indian treaty rights yeah. or Gary George for various forms of corruption or the Republican who voted uh, for uh, a sales tax for the Brewer Stadium. And you recall, too, there was a statewide organization for recalls after Tom Amon and the, the Democrats in Milwaukee County voted themselves generous pensions. Mm -hmm. So now you, you find that that party is claiming that we're tired, we've <laughs> been you know, overburdened with these constant reelections, and that the Democrats are at fault. But they were forced into it because it was that uh, Utah anti-immigrant group that immediately came out trying to penalize all the Democrats mm -hmm. they could for mm -hmm. fleeing the state, okay. trying to build on the antipathy, the anger with, with uh, the Democrats fleeing to avoid a quorum. And, uh, as it, and the Democrats responded. Well, actually, it was uh, local individuals who uh, initiated these efforts, followed by the unions, and the Democrats came in later to give it organization. Yeah. So with uh, the Democrats picking up two seats in the mm -hmm. Senate and the majority now held by the Republicans by just one seat, we've got uh, you know a lot of political pundits saying there will be the moderate Republicans who are going to possibly shift some of their positions to a Democratic thing, depending on what the issue is. We've also got Governor Walker now calling for more moderate politics. Um, and I want to talk about that for sure. Okay. <laughs> but uh, just in general, Jim, do you do you think there will be um, more of a willingness to work in a bipartisan way? I think there'll be a more willingness to talk about working okay. in a bipartisan way. Big difference. <laughs> Big, <laughs> Big difference. difference. Yeah. I, I I really think that um, um, uh, the Democrats. If they were looking for people who are in trouble, they were the the uh, legislators who were elected in 2010. In other words, there's a wave election, and there were a number of Republicans who were elected who are, you know, relatively fringe when it comes to their politics, more conservative than their districts. And there were a number of Democrats who were defeated who were big surprises. These are mainly assembly seats. In the assembly, but also in the Senate. Okay. I mean, uh, essentially, 2010 wiped out the Democratic right. leadership. Right. You know, Russ Decker on down. Right. Um, in, in the Senate you had, remember the other scandal with the Senate um, Democratic leader who had an affair with the um, payday loan right. uh, oh, yes. lobbyist, yes. <laughs> and he lost. I mean, <laughs> so, you know, and, and that was a, considered to be a relatively safe Democratic district, and it probably still is, yeah. with someone else running for that office. So you would think that uh, those people who are Republicans who are elected in Democratic leaning districts um, and who uh, would be most threatened by recall would be the ones most likely to be compromising. Except that because um, they were they came out of the the right wing of the Republican Party personally and ideologically, they're not willing to compromise. Mm -hmm. So really, the moderate Republicans tend to be. Um, the old heads who have been around for a long time, like uh, um, Dale Schultz or Mike Ellis. Mm -hmm. Guess know. my answer is what's left to compromise? Well, Dick Spanbauer is another one who I think probably could be considered a moderate, yeah, and yeah. he's relatively new. Yeah. Yeah. 
you know, but you're probably right. Yeah. There, there probably aren't a whole lot. There aren't a whole lot. No. Yeah. And and b besides, the governor can threaten to primary people. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, if you if you don't go along, we're going to find mm -hmm. a Tea Party candidate who you, pr may not be able to win the the general election, but mm -hmm. can beat you in a primary. Well, let's talk about the gov. <laughs> 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 you know, he he wants to. Uh, he's he's calling for more moderate politics and uh, bipartisan ship and what have you and a lot of folks are just saying liar liar pants on fire we don't believe you uh, this is all just talk do you think he's just kind of running scared because he's seen what the recall elections have accomplished or he's seen the the you know popularity polls um, his I'm trying to find where this was here that I just uh, saw this um, uh, I, I just here fifty nine percent disapproval rating right. um, that he's already got, and you know, do you think it has to do with that? Does it have to do with the recall elections? Um, you know, a combination well, he's, of everything. Well, he, he's nearly as unpopular as Jim Doyle was when he decided not to run for mm -hmm. another term. So there's that, and then I, politicians can count, and you can see that with the drop off for these. Uh, Republicans that um, with the same uh, vote totals he would have lost the election mm -hmm. and several polls show him losing to prospective Democratic candidates should there be a recall. Uh, the polls are now showing that um, there's a majority against a recall mm -hmm. because there are like 10 percent of the voters who 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 might vote to recall uh, Walker but they don't want to face this continuous permanent campaign. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm and these le electoral cycles that run one right after another. Um, and you have most conservative commentators that people are burned out, we need to stop all of this. But they would because they, they, they really understand that this would be a very serious and close election. Well, and yet the Democrats are still saying, you know, they're going to move forward with a recall. Um, I mean, do you think that they would just be better off spending their, their time, their money, and their efforts on the presidential campaign and finding um, a competent opponent for Walker in the next election term? Well, um, let me give you on the one hand and on the other. Okay. Hand. On the one hand, it's going to take 540,000 valid like signatures. signatures. Yeah. Um, that's a huge number. Especially in winter. And you're going to have to collect really three quarters of a million because many of these signatures are going to be challenged and disallowed. So um, you've got people who have been continuously involved in these recall campaigns, making phone calls, canvassing, going door to door, you know, out with their clipboard collecting signatures, and that's a lot of continuous work over a lot of long period of time, and not what you'd usually expect even your most devout followers to, to do. Um, a recall campaign would be incredibly expensive at a time when there are other elections. I mean, it, recall might not even be in November. You know, it might mm -hmm. not be when regular elections are. It, it's not clear what would happen. Mm -hmm. You might have fake candidates again forcing, yeah. forcing primaries. Right. Primaries. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, so you, you have no idea. I mean, it will be a strategic decision to right. when they think the recall ought to be. Both parties will be maneuvering around that. Um, Will the various outside interest groups be willing to spend this amount of money <laughs> on a gubernatorial recall when there are all these other important elections and policies mm -hmm. going on? I, I find it hard to believe that would be true. So, uh, but the Democrats might be forced into it because, um, you know, the, the uh, cuts in compensation based upon increasing costs for health care and, uh, and uh, pensions are going to kick in. I don't think the governor is going to compromise on additional changes in education that he wants. So the teachers haven't seen the last of. Mm -hmm. I mean, the governor promised to, you know, rate public schools on A to F, yeah. and uh, rate teachers as well. Mm -hmm. And um, now, without the protection of collective bargaining, you're subject to changes in the handbook, whatever those are going to be. And for state employees, the Department of Administration is going to come down with. Uh, ways in which your your uh, work day is going to be regulated. A 
talk about just the recall in general. Sure. Uh, the recall was approved by the voters of Wisconsin in November of 1926. Uh, there are a lot of people who like to get rid of it. Uh, what's your response to that? Uh, you know, I, I don't think that there's a... I mean, there are people talking about getting rid of it, but most of the discussion, practical discussion, is about modifying it. Right. Now, first, the recall in Wisconsin has a fairly high um, uh, fence you have to jump over. Because unlike California, you need, you know, 12% rather than 25% here. And you've got a much longer period to collect the signatures. Um, uh, plus, there's no, there aren't primaries, you know, people just announce for their candidacy and you, you, you run against the field. So other states have a, a lower threshold than Wisconsin. Plus, there, there's also the issue, let's say that you do, as some states do, where you require that uh, something serious like um, malfeasance in office or high crimes and misdemeanors or mm -hmm. something approaching a felony. Do you really want the courts to decide that? Because if I were being recalled and there were language and statutes that said that there had to be some, you know, something serious that I had done, that um, the first thing I would do is hire a lawyer and go to court and, and ultimately, you know, you, you, you would have probably appeal these things and ultimately you'd have the Supreme Court deciding what is basically a political issue rather than voters deciding whether or not something is serious enough mm -hmm. to justify the recall. Um, another point too is that recalls are rarely used for legislative races. There's only been four occasions in the state's history where that's happened. Most of the time it's used to remove local officials like uh, the mayor of Sheboygan, for example. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, They're not even yeah, using it there. Exactly. <laughs> and, well, well, that's the point. Because, and, and most of these recall efforts fail because you realize how many signatures you have to take and how quickly you have to do it. I mean, I, I've been involved with groups in the city of Oshkosh that wanted to remove elected officials. Mm -hmm. and, and it usually fell through because you realize, I mean, how many signatures you have to collect. In a and, short period of time. In a short period of time. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. and quite often it is during cold weather. Yeah. You know, and, and that's tough too. Um, speaking of the mayor of Sheboygan, um, for, for just a moment, uh, because I don't want to lose track of that, and then we can go back to this other stuff. Um, you know, I mean, the city council there is looking to remove him, and they're hiring a sure. special prosecutor to do so. Do they, I know you're not a lawyer, Jim, but you've seen things like this, I'm sure, over the years. I mean, can they really legally remove an elected official? I don't, I don't see how that is going to happen. Yeah, yeah I mean, because you know, they didn't put him in office. I, I mean, um, if, if the council was serious about it, th they could initiate a recall effort. Mm -hmm. I mean, th and they haven't done it. I mean, th this looks this this looks like uh, more legal action to try to embarrass the mayor into voluntarily removing himself. And he's already promising a very protracted yeah. legal battle. Exactly. So. And and you have to wonder too. Um, whatever language is being considered now, would that be enough to justify removing the mayor because he, he you see him on a video drunk in a casino? That's not a felony. Mm -hmm. I mean, he wasn't mm -hmm. driving drunk or doing anything that. You know, it might be embarrassing, mm -hmm. but it, but it is that a, a sufficient justification for recall? Uh, Tom Amon and the uh, county board in Milwaukee. I mean, they voted themselves general, uh, very generous pensions. Mm -hmm. uh, n not a crime. Um, m maybe awful. Perception is very bad, but mm -hmm. I yeah. mean, would that be sufficient to justify the recall? Mm -hmm. <coughs> Or would the, the the county officials say, "Look, you know we're going to hire attorneys and we're going to challenge the recall petition. You you shouldn't be able to remove us. Wait till you know our term." Although that's the argument that a lot of people who were opposed to these call these recall races were saying is that there were no crimes committed. So uh, well, we but shouldn't. the point is there rarely are there crimes committed yeah. that when there are recalls. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm using the Amon example. Yeah. I'm using that because some talk show hosts like Charlie Sykes was extremely favorably disposed to recalls then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not now. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and 
it, it's often based upon the way you voted. That, that is, conservative voters don't like a property tax increase or they don't like a garbage fee or they, yeah. there's something that the council or mayor does that they're really offended by. They think it's awful. Maybe you think it's a crime that your taxes increased, but... <laughs> okay, um, you were two, 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 for, two for all last time. You predicted only two Democrats would win and Jess King would win. Yeah. So I want to get another bet out of your... For, okay. If the 2012 elections were held this November, yeah. would Obama, Jessica King, and Gordon Hintz be defeated? Um, yeah, are you talking about in the state of Wisconsin for well, Obama? No, I, I yeah, think I, I, I think well, Obama will carry the state of Wisconsin. Really? Yeah. Hmm. Mark that down. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Mark that down. Okay. I think I think. Uh, Are we Obama, betting the farm on this, or I, um, just just a, a, I'll bet, bet the outbuilding this time. Okay, <laughs> a little less. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'll, how about Jess King and Gordon Hintz? You want to bet your shoes? Um, Gordon, I think, will survive his personal problems. Okay. And I, I would, I would be guessing that he'll be returned. Okay. Um, I want, would want to look at um, uh, King's district has been redrawn okay. slightly, and I would want to see how that would is going to affect the makeup of the district. Uh, but she does have the advantage of incumbency now. Sure. And. Um, you found um, uh, all things being equal, uh, incumbents like Holprin, who are in overwhelmingly Republican districts, who survive anyway. And uh, you really want to know: can they find a candidate like Randy Hopper? I mean, or I mean, we've had some very good Republicans who um, who were elected in this district. Um, uh, Greg Underheim managed to survive mm -hmm. for years in an yeah. urban urban setting. So. Yeah. Without knowing who the Republican candidate is, that one I'm less willing to bet on. Okay. Okay. You had a question about Michelle Lichens as well. Yeah. Um, the first name Michelle has to be has a certain popular political ring to it right now. Um, do you think that uh, the likes of Michelle Bachman increase the future political career of Michelle Lichens? I do. Mm -hmm. I mean, in many ways, um, Lichens is in the mold of, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, attractive woman, mm -hmm. very conservative. Um, you know, it has the same kind of Christian, you know, religious orientation, um, uh, outspoken, um, uh, sometimes uh, prone to gaffes mm -hmm. um, or misstatements. So she, I think she has a, a similar career path. In fact, um, again, going back to conservative talk radio, uh, she, she's been talked about as a potential uh, Senate candidate or even a gubernatorial candidate. So, or Pete Rice seat if he were to sit down. Yes. Yes, I mean, and she certainly has an appeal to uh, uh, a wing of the Republican Party. Uh, real quickly, because uh, we're almost out of time, uh, Tommy Thompson is looking at uh, making a bid for the Senate. Uh, what do you think about that? Well, we don't yet know yet where whether Thompson is serious. I mean, he, he's put a little bit more effort this time into make it, making it appear mm -hmm. that he is. Uh, he may be shocked to discover that, uh, given the way in which the Republican Party has moved, that Tommy is going to be perceived as kind of a rhino, a Republican in name only, a big government, mm -hmm. big spending, um, uh, you know, person that everyone likes, but that many conservatives would rather find someone more pure uh, okay. to seek that seat. A lot of predictions. We've got a lot. Yeah, yeah. You may you may end up owning a whole farm. <laughs> oh, this the shack that he built is <laughs> not worth much. <laughs> but it could be worth more if there's chickens being raised on it. You well, just that's you true. just never that's know. True. So anyway, thanks, Jim. It's thanks always a, lot, a Jim. pleasure. Enjoy sure. it so. very much. We are going to take a real short break. When we come back, we're going to be talking about the city's uh, proposed bicycle and pedestrian path. We'll be right back.
Every year, the U.S. Department of the Treasury receives about 1.4 million reports of problems with paper checks. Checks can be lost, stolen, or delayed. If you still receive Social Security payments by paper check, Treasury wants you to know about a safer, more convenient way to get your money. The Direct Express Prepaid Debit MasterCard. The Direct Express card is new and is available to anyone receiving Social Security benefits, even if you don't have a bank account. Your monthly benefits will be automatically placed onto your card account each month on the day your money is due. While other debit cards cost money, it is possible to use the Direct Express card for free to make purchases, pay bills, and get cash at thousands of locations nationwide. There are no sign-up or monthly account fees. No more waiting for the mail or worrying about lost or stolen checks. Call 1-877-212-9991 or visit www.usdirectexpress.com. And we're back for the second half of Ayan Oshkosh. Uh, joining us now is uh, citizen advocate uh, Justin Mitchell. He's been on many times in the past and also principal planner for the city of Oshkosh, one of the principal planners anyway. David Buck is here. And uh, welcome to both welcome. of you. We're going to be talking about uh, a proposed uh, pedestrian and bike path for the city. Um, and uh, we're grateful to both of you for taking some time out tonight to come in and chat about this. This has been proposed for a while. And now we actually have a, uh, a draft plan which we're all sitting here yes. with our copy of, except for Dan. I'm going to listen. Share gonna, it with you, listen. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I do have a question just in general terms about this, because this is, I realize it's a draft plan, and it's dated July, mm -hmm. but just a week ago, and again, we're taping this on the 18th of August, a week ago, there was a, a public meeting held to get some public input. I, I'm curious, this seems like, wouldn't you, kind of putting the cart before the horse, wouldn't you get public input before putting a draft together? Oh, for sure. And we did do that. This has okay. been a really long process. It's been about 24 months that the steering wow, group, which is years, about okay. a yeah, okay. steering committee or stakeholder steering group is what they call them. It's not a committee of citizens, about 20 members have been working on it over the, over the past 24 months. But at the, at the start of it in 2009, um, there were several open houses and several I don't know what you want to call them, sort of information gathering okay. meetings, people putting dots on maps, saying where are you coming from, where do you want to go. I've got um, the January 2010 draft here. In okay, case you want all to right, excellent. One. <laughs> right, an original draft came in January uh, 2010, and stakeholders and steering group felt it was um, not adequate, and it was not Oshkosh specific. Um, and so they went about making it Oshkosh specific. Well, I know we've got a lot of specific kinds of questions, but just in general terms, how have the two drafts changed? Oh, they've changed drastically. Right. Have they? Drastically. Can I, can I just go really quick here on your, your, your concept of waiting to get citizen feedback? Sure, yeah. Go I, ahead. I have a, just some of the, the main points. In December 2009, they did a citizen survey, and they got about 500 respondents, which is a pretty good uh, response mm -hmm. for our city. I just want to go over some of these numbers here really sure, quick because they're yeah. pretty overwhelming. Um, so uh, about 25% of the folks that responded indicated that they would be willing to bike to work. Now that's a pretty good number. I bike to work because I'm pretty close to my work, but 25%, mm -hmm. that's one in four, right? 90% said they would bike, walk, or hike for transportation or recreation. 95% felt that increasing the number of walkers and bicyclists would have a positive health impact on our city. Now that's kind of common sense, right? The more you mm -hmm. do physical activity. 60% indicated they would bike uh, with some regularity if we developed um, some infrastructure. 71% indicated their main concern for bicycles uh, in our city for bicycling is bicycle on friendly roadways. And then 89%, almost 100%, so 89% reported that they would bike more if routes were established. Mm -hmm. That's about somewhere between four and 500 respondents per question. Um, that's just an overwhelming support for this type of thing. And that was back in December 2009 that they did that. January 2010, they released the initial draft. And then from there, I mean, ev every month they've been meeting. Um, they've gotten yeah. feedback from different mm -hmm. boards. 
Um, recently, uh, uh, David's been going very um, <laughs> actively giving this oh, yeah. presentation to the extent where I think the, the TV crew here could probably deliver it. They've yeah. seen it so much. Oh, so. for sure. Okay. Well, and at the initial onset, we were at, we had uh, information boards and infor information gathering kiosk at the Tour to Titan, uh, at the Granny Smith Walk, at the UWO's Transportation Day, um, our original open house. I mean, the survey was real important. The original open house, we had to gather information. I think we had about 70 citizens there. Um, the open house we had just to present this plan, we had at the Willow Room in the Senior Center, which is pretty big, mm -hmm. we had uh, over 80 people, the room was packed. Yeah. So uh, it's nice to see that interest has not waned at all yeah. over that long period of time, because it did take a long time, but um, sometimes it takes a little longer to get something that's, that's good. Sure. When I was a kid growing up here in Oshkosh, and this absolutely predates both of you, <laughs> <laughs> which shows either how young you are or how old I am. Come maybe uh, maybe a little we'll both. write this down. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. but we had a bike route in town, and okay. there were little green and white signs that were around. Now, I'm sure, and I don't know what happened to that. That's kind of one of my questions, and maybe both of you through your research know, but um, there were little green and white signs around town, and you just sort of followed it, and it was really great fun to do on a Saturday or Sunday with friends and stuff. Do you know whatever happened to that bike route? I mean, I realize now the way our city has grown and changed, mm -hmm. obviously we have to take into account a much larger area, but just in general terms, do you know what happened to that particular route and why it went away? I don't know. I don't, okay. I don't know for that particular. If I had to guess, it probably had a lot to do with the uh, massive uh, appeal of automobiles. Okay. Building all your roads for automobiles and really ignoring all the other users. Um, I mean, to the extent where you have some town roads, not in the city, thank God, but town roads don't even supply sidewalks or shoulders. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is designed specifically for cars, and that was a problematic in the 50s, 60s, 70s, into the 80s, where things started shifting back around to now where you have, and you can tell by the survey, national surveys as well, uh, sort of a complete street request by, by citizens. Um, and so that's kind of what things are going back to that way. Sure. Uh, but I don't know what specifically happened to those roads. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. We've done the chronology up till now. What's the chronology from here on out? Well, uh, the next phase of this is going to the council workshop okay. next Tuesday on the 23rd. Um, that's going to be taking all the comments on this draft plan, the most okay. recent draft plan, to the council. Um, they've all seen the presentation probably multiple times. Um, and then they'll kind of look at that, whittle okay. away, and then decide where they want to bring it from there, if they want to take action or if they want to hold another workshop or, okay. or whatnot. Will it go back to you or more than likely not? Uh, probably just for editing. Okay, okay. We should note that um, you, you presented at the, the Parks Board and Parks Advisory, Sustainability yeah. Advisory, the Traffic uh, Review Advisory, the Plan Commission. Um, we did a joint workshop where everybody was invited, including the council. Um, so I've been presenting a lot. And, yeah. <laughs> okay, now the and now here you are yeah. again. Now, again. <laughs> now the, the main issue for the council is whether they want to give one third of one percent of the transportation money t to implement that. Is that correct? Well, part? It, it, well, no, it's if they if if the council agrees with the recommendations of the plan. I mean, the plan recommendations are not only the physical items. Um, the primary recommendation is to create a individual independent commission dealing exclusively with pedestrian and bicycle issues. Okay. Um, but then also there's an education element, an outreach okay. element. Uh, sort of the, uh, the flash in the pan that everybody likes are the bike lanes, the, the physical developments, but that's only a small portion of the plan. Okay. Um, you need education, outreach, uh, enforcement, maintenance are all really important factors because you can put all the routes in you want. Mm -hmm. If you don't educate motorists, bicyclists, pedestrians on how to use the systems properly, right. um, and also they're not maintained, they don't last too long. But there is some transportation money that they will want to put into this, right? Oh, for sure. Okay. Yeah. And if I can just clarify in your numbers, because you were right, yeah. but make it clear, is we spend about 8 to $9 million a year on, on road transportation related right. costs. It's 40 to $45 million over a five-year period. For the bike plan, initially, we're looking at 175. Okay, 175. When I say we, the, the city is. Yeah. I mean, that's less than half of 1%. Okay. Uh, despite the fact that uh, bicycling accounts for about 9% of all uh, uh, transportation okay. that, that happens nationally. Um, so, I mean, it's really, 175 is a lot of money, without a doubt. 
but in terms of our, uh, our transportation yeah. entities. Mm -hmm. And I think you've said in your presentations there's a lot of opportunity for grants and, and sure. all sorts of other things that you could. And that's important too because most of the grants that are out there, whether they be transportation, most of them are for transportation purposes, but also okay. recreational grants, trails, and that kind of thing. Uh, most of those grants you're not eligible unless you have a plan in place. Okay. So you can't even apply for them to get them um, without something in place. Okay. Um, you know, you, you mentioned, David, about education and safety and that kind of thing. We are getting so many roundabouts in this city that mm -hmm. it really is difficult to get from one place to another without encountering at least one roundabout um, right. in a lot of cases, multiple ones. Um, it, they're already, they're, they're still somewhat unsafe because of the way people are driving in them. It's, it's not yeah. the concept, it's the drivers <laughs> who are causing the unsafe issues. Mm -hmm. And I see this as being even more unsafe for bicyclists. So what additional things, if any, will the city or whatever group wants to bring this forward will be done to help ensure safety of bicyclists going through and those? And pedestrians. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, well, the plan itself, when, they, when the stakeholder and steering group chose their routes, uh, one of their fundamental items was first they're going for a, for bicycling, a basic bicyclist, not an advanced who's going to take the lane and not a novice who should probably be on the sidewalk. Um, so they designed it to take the routes to stay off of the main drags wherever possible. I mean, some streets, you, there was no alternative. Um, so in those cases, they tried to avoid the roundabouts. Roundabouts are not pedestrian or bicycle friendly. No. Mm -mm. Um, and that's just the way they are. Mm -hmm. uh, but some of the recommendations on here uh, in the plan and actually one that came out that'll be reviewed by the council is uh, to put in the design section uh, to put in push button uh, pedestrian timing for the roundabouts. Uh, it's kind of counterproductive to what the roundabouts is supposed to continually move traffic mm -hmm. um, but especially for visually impaired. Uh, there's no break in the noise to know when you can walk because it's constantly spinning around the roundabout mm -hmm. um, and then there's no audible signals. Um, so that's something the council have to look at. But, uh, you know, they are going all over the state, all over the country, actually. Um, and a lot of it's going to be the education, education of the motorist. Because like you say, they're cruising through there at speeds that are yeah. inappropriate. Yeah. And I should note that we, the plan has um, the possibility of, of an overpass on Highway 41 and other routes that aren't mm -hmm. incorporated into the first five years. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of money. And so I think what, what the, the idea was, and, and I'd like to see bike lanes everywhere all over the place, right? But I think mm -hmm. a more modest approach is to start out with some of the more affordable, simple uh, projects. If we're going to be redoing a road uh, on, on a site and it fits with our plan, we're going to put the lane in there. Therefore, there's not really a, a lot of additional costs to do that. Further, it's not all just bike lanes. You can do a, a share where you have a shared lane and it's signed um, and there's a lot of other things that are much more cost eff effective right away <laughs> and, and you know uh, based on the success of that we can uh, start going maybe some of those broad These bike short. lanes are going to be marked on the street? Right well there's different bicycle facility types okay. and the, the highest order is a bike lane a striped bike lane okay. which I think everybody knows with a sign with the uh, bicycle in the in the lane yep. uh, painted on the street the next step down from that would it's called a shero which is basically signing, and I guess I should say that all the routes recommended in this plan need to be signed. They recommend they all sign, okay. which kind of leads to what you're saying. Yeah. Going back to what you were saying yeah. before, but a Shero is a chevron, which is two uh, right. sort of arrows, and then a bicycle right. symbol in the lane, in the appropriate spot in the lane that you're out of the door zone, but you're still to the right side of the lane, and it's just basically stating, um, making the point, this is a shared lane. Expect to see bikes here. Um, so when you have instances where cars are driving, uh, they see these, these signs, they see the um, Shero symbols, the chevrons on the thing, on the pavement, and over time they learn that if they can't handle riding with bikes, they don't take that route. Because the bicycle is going to be going slower and they're going to have to slow down sure. or, sh or shift lanes. Um, but the beauty with the plan too is that they built in a lot of flexibility. So, and um, as Justin had said, if the plan recommends a bike lane on a street, but it's not re being rebuilt for 10, 15 years, um, you would go down to a next facility type. So the bike lane would change to a Shero, and then when you do rebuild it in 15 years, you'd put the bike lane in. Okay. That way you have the connected network, you don't have the cost, you know, or retrofit cost, I should say. Um, you eventually have it when you rebuild it. 
Okay. Now you guys brought uh, a map or two with you here. Um, I think uh, we've got a pointer there. If uh, somebody uh, wants to just kind of point to what we're talking about. I'm th now, exactly what is the plan that we're, or the map that we're looking at here? Well, the one you're looking at now is the full road system plan. And on this plan, let's see if I can, ah, ah I can point that here. Works good. There's three different colors. You have some purple routes on here, and those are uh, multi-use trails. Multi-use okay. trails are for pedestrians and bikes. You're going to see those along waterways. Um, and obviously on the riverfront, which is a hot topic one right now, you can see that. Um, but there are also side paths, which are larger, basically function like sidewalks, but they're larger okay. and set farther from the street. The blue on here are bike lanes, so those would be your striped lanes. Um, and the red ones are sharrows, or shared roadways. And it's not just sharrows, it's also, uh, you have sharrows, you could have um, paved shoulders in rural sections, wider outside lanes in, in urban sections that don't necessarily have the traffic volumes. Um, you'll see a lot of them on local streets because they have to lead to schools, to churches, other destination spots. Um, and local streets, all you'd really need is the signs. Those, mm -hmm. those are low volume um, streets. People expect to see people on bikes, people walking, and they typically drive a lot slower. Okay. So okay. thanks for the pointer, Mary Ellen. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. That was those, great. Uh, <laughs> but that's what that map represents. There's also a five-year priority map uh, which is just, as I said, coincides with the capital improvement program. So they try to install the routes as they're doing the streets anyway, and then um, make those connections uh, in a five-year aspect. Every year that commission uh, would amend the plan, and every five years they would do a full update. So it stays relevant. CIP is five years, updates five years, kind of coincides together. Okay, all right. So what are the things that people have said they want to see on a bike route or a uh, pedestrian route or uh, where they want to see these routes going. Uh, what, what has the general consensus been from the various public meetings that mm -hmm. you've attended and heard from people at? S schools, parks, uh, shopping centers such mm -hmm. as grocery stores, uh, cool. university, mm -hmm. um, and that was part of the survey as well as they got feedback on as to where people would like to be able to get to. The, w the way the plan is drafted, it, it goes origins and destinations. Destinations are, are those things that Justin had just mentioned. Um, but also what a lot of people pointed out were problem areas and, and hazard areas. Crossing 41 is considered a hazard area. Mm -hmm. Crossing the, the river was considered a hazard area. Mm -hmm. Jackson Street at certain intersections was a hazard area. Mm -hmm. um, and so they identified those as, as just problem areas. You have to get across 41, especially if you live on the far <laughs> west yeah. side. Yeah. Um, and how do you do that safely? Mm -hmm. So the plan does address that now with all the roundabouts and stuff. Um, the plan does address how to navigate a roundabout, um, but obviously it's not ideal. <laughs> um, what about going to like um, medical facilities? I mean, we, you know, a lot of people, I would think, would want to maybe or bike yeah. to those places, or walk. doctors' offices, or walk, uh, doctors' offices, dental offices, yep. maybe in to a lesser degree. But you know, the the big places that we see are, you know, the hospitals, and then Theta Care, and um, Affinity, and Aurora. Hmm. Um, Yep. And yes, you have to kind of cross a highway, sort of, to get there, but you don't have to really cross the highway, per se. You can go out Witzel right. and, and get to those places, too. You can, and those um, were all, all identified as destinations, um, uh, medical facilities for sure, but yes, the schools, uh, recreation centers, like the Y, even private recreation centers, uh, were all identified. So the routes, when they were determined by the stakeholders, they connected to all those. Okay. Um, now, once again, it is a uh, continually updated annually, mm -hmm. so as more destinations appear, routes would have to be designated to them. If they go away, routes could possibly be removed. Um, but yeah, those were, that was a lot of the initial work in 2009 was getting that information. Mm -hmm. That's what really what we were looking mm -hmm. for, because you can't really design the plan without that. Sure. Something that people don't always think about is the fact that a, a decent percentage of our population has to bike or walk to get to work. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I just before I came here I was dropping my kids off and there was a lady that had some noticeable injuries and um, so we were chatting about what, what had happened and she was chatting with my wife and so she was biking on South Park and there um, pretty fast uh, traffic out there and she was biking to work and she doesn't have her license she medically can't get a license and she uses 
uh, bicycling for her m main transportation route. Uh, so she was on South Park. There was a car coming fast behind her, so she started to kind of move over and speed up, and it seemed to not be moving over at all for her. She got a little bit scared, moved over. It came right by her. She hit the curb, went over her at the front of her handlebar, mm. so she had quite a, quite large bruises. Now, she's a lower-income individual, doesn't have insurance, so she went to the clinic. They said, you got to go to get to the emergency room to get x-rays. She goes there. She's told she can't work. So you have somebody who, because of the current situation, isn't able to get to work now, um, uh, had additional costs in the emergency room, which you hear in today's environment. Mm. We want to get rid of that stuff because that increases our medical costs, things like that. Um, and so, I mean, there are real life situations where people rely on bicycling and they expect to do it safe in our community and our, as a community we should want to be able to provide that type of option for people. So. Mm -hmm. Well, and one thing that uh, I'm sure a lot of folks may know, but I in the event that someone doesn't, um, our bus system, they have bike racks on, the, I think it's the front of the buses? Yep. Is mm -hmm. that where they are? Bike and and so if you want to, you know, do a bus in conjunction with uh, biking, um, mm -hmm. there is a way to do that. And I'm assuming that the bike routes are going to be, uh, or probably have already been set up to coincide with the bus routes in most cases okay yeah. All right. sure. um, I want to just play with yeah, it and sure. I'll hit Justin on this um, you were kind of involved with the uh, and I'm not doing this to, to criticize with the uh, the ordinance to allow four chickens in, in mine houses sure. and you know your statistics before were pretty good it seemed pretty good but when you got to the council it seemed to be sort of a, a generational issue between the older council members and the younger ones and one of them really put a poison pill amendment on it which effectively killed it that was Esslinger that did that, was it not? No, I think it was Steve Cummings, wasn't it? I, I'm not sure. Right. It was I Cummings. Think, yeah. yeah. Oh. But my okay. point is, um, you know, is bicycling maybe going to bring out a generational thing? The younger people in the community really want bikes, but maybe some of the older members don't want it? Do you see that coming as a possibility? Um, I would say for the last maybe five years that I've been involved in local election campaigns and, and forums that we have. This is a topic that comes up every year. Right. And every year at these forums, I'm by far the youngest guy there. I mean, you have mm. a lot of elderly people that are involved in city politics. Yeah. And they're all talking about, yeah, we, we need bicycle lanes. Okay. Yeah, we would support that. Um, I mean, it's I don't know if they have the demographic information of the, the survey respondents. Yeah. But you got, I mean, I would assume that, that it's not just young people. The people on the plan, the planning boards that, that participated in this, I mean, they're not necessarily young people under the age of 35. When I went to the presentation of the city, the initial presentation, um, I mean, there were people there that, that you know, were very old and very young. I mean, this is a bicycle and walking plan, so, mm -hmm. I mean, it's not specific, and, you know, the stat that I have here is a third of the population doesn't have a license. Yeah. That's young kids. Yeah, that's, you know, uh, uh, disabled. Uh, uh, but you also have elderly folks that don't have sure. um, uh, access to a license and they may be walking or bicycling. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so you don't see this as a problem? No, not at all. And I actually, I have a, a, some, a, a, a quote here because I understand um, there might be some people, um, maybe the same character, that might not be in support of, of bicycling. And I just wanted to note, and, and maybe David wanted to refer to a story about Green, Green Bay, but there's a quote from the senior policy representative with the National Association of Realtors in which he said that safe bicycling options increase the livability of the neighborhood and the value of properties. Um, what I would... David used to work in Green Bay, and I was talking okay. that some of the information I found was that in uh, Brown County, there's a really nice trail that goes all the way down to Manitowoc. And uh, what they found is along that trail, properties sell 9% quicker hmm. than tr properties that are, are not along that trail. And um, are you able to talk well, about Sure. That? When I had worked up in Green Bay area, and uh, uh, when that trail, it was a rails to trail, it was an old rail line. Uh, when that was proposed to go to a trail system, most of the adjoining neighbors fought it. They did not want it, did not want it, did not want it. It was going to you know, destroy the property values. There was going to be gangs running around up and down on the trails. Um, after it was in, I don't know how many, it was a couple of years, two, three years later, they started surveying those residents again, and they didn't find one person that didn't like it, and quite a few wanted to connect to it from their private property, from their yards. Because at first when they put it in, they had purposely tried to block off with vegetation and, and fencing, um, and they wanted that removed now. So I think that perception and the fear of not knowing 
um, disappeared when it was in there, and then they became a big advantage for their property and for sales, I guess, but I think just for livability. Yeah. Change is a hard word for Oshkosh to, to deal with. It's a hard uh, word for everywhere. I think. Yeah, <laughs> but it's really hard here. <laughs> I think it's harder in Oshkosh, yeah. yeah. I, I think I, right. I hope it goes, but I, you know, I'm just mm -hmm. raising that as... Yeah, you know. but like Cheryl had said, one of the beauties with this is this is not a new concept. No. Bicycling and walking right. was huge. Right. Um, not that many years ago, 50 years ago. Right. Um, I had read somewhere, um, and I don't know how factual this is, that in the early 1900s, roads were paved not for cars, but for bicycles. Yeah. There weren't hardly any cars, but a lot of people were bicycling yeah. and walking. They didn't want to be in the mud. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's kind of interesting that mm -hmm. that facility had converted over almost exclusively to cars mm -hmm. within you know, 50, 60 years, and now it's starting to try to become complete again. A good example is a farmer's market. Every Saturday there are more bikers up at the farmer's market. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know whether there are bike racks anywhere, yeah. but, but anyway, you see a couple with two bikes walking their way through down Main looking for this. they got little baskets on their bikes, so yeah. people are biking to the farmer's market. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And there are a lot of bike racks that have just oh, been really? just the last couple months, yeah. Where are they at? They're um, usually on the back side. Okay. They want to keep the, the front side open for the cafes and for yeah. the, uh, well, for the stalls, obviously, but the pedestrians. Yeah. Okay. So if this passes at the council level, and hopefully it will, how soon before it can begin to be implemented? Sure. You're already seeing implementation. I'll let him talk about it. But, uh, I mean, this plan, before it was even approved, just the general idea and the concepts are, have already been incorporated this year. The bike racks is one example. Mm -hmm. Right. The, back, the bike racks, uh, Main Street was not really designed for bicycles, but definitely for pedestrians. And that was before this plan was going, uh, before the surveys or anything. But uh, it was kind of refreshing to see at the last capital improvement program, they put a nominal amount of money, I think it was 20000 for signage and striping, uh, even though the, the plan wasn't adopted yet. Um, and when they identified streets to be reconstructed, uh, they put a footnote on them saying, this is a bicycle route. This is a bicycle route. Um, didn't designate facilities. Obviously, they have to be designed. It's really yeah. preliminary in the CIP. But I think that uh, the elected officials see the value in that when they were doing their CIP mm -hmm. and thought, well, we need to consider this when we're doing our streets anyway. Um, obviously, when, how it gets designed, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Well, so when you think about the education piece and you think about the signage piece and the you know striping on the roadways, um, are there other elements to this, other pieces that have to come into play, or are those the three main ones? And if so, when would you hope that all of that would be in place so that this <laughs> is a <laughs> final deal? Give us a date. <laughs> well, I can't give you a date. Uh, it's a 20-year plan, right? <laughs> yeah, and it gets updated every five years, so it could be longer than that. But so it's, it's, an, it's it's an ongoing. It's, yeah. it's not a static document. Yeah. No, definitely okay. not. Right. Um, but you had kind of mentioned some of the other things that are in there. Um, you know, there's the maintenance, enforcement changes. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. enforcement, you need to enforce. Okay. Uh, the kid who rides his bike on in between two parked SUVs in the mid-block, that biker needs an explanation that they can't do that and possibly needs a fine from a police officer when they do that. Mm -hmm. But also the motorist, like you just mentioned, that's encroaching into a bicycle's area um, for whatever reason. Um, they need to be educated as well. Um, so that education element is really big, but once the roads are in place and start getting in place, people start seeing them, they get more used to it. If they just hate bicycles and don't want to be anywhere near them, they're going to switch their routes. Okay. Um, so it, it's, an ongoing, it's an ongoing effort, but we're hoping within five years to have a, a nicely connected um, sort of small scale uh, route network that is interconnected. Now some okay. of the items in here are Sort of pie in the sky. We gotta wrap up. Oh, sorry. So. But <laughs> That's all right. But thank you. Anyway, thank sorry. You. I could so. talk for hours. <laughs> all right. All right. Well, thanks, guys, very much thanks for being for here, working. and thanks um, for having you us. know, this will be going to the council sometime in the next uh, month or so. So, anyway, that's gonna do it for us. Uh, thank you very much uh, to all of you, and to Jim Simmons earlier, and to these gentlemen right now, and to the crew as well. So, we will see you next time. Until then, take good care. Keep your eye on us. We've got our eye on Oshkosh. Oshkosh.